choice for bicuspid aortic valve disease in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Greg and the, and the, and the staff today for inviting me. It's the first time, my first time in Athens since over 30 years. And the previous time I was here, I was a member of the national swimming team of Belgium. So it was a different, uh, different setting. So I'm going to talk about uh, why I think TAVR is a very good idea for patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis. And Dr. Galapas already did a very good presentation and set the stage for my talk, um, as you will learn. These are my conflicts. So first of all, a couple of facts. So bicuspid aortic stenosis is not exclusive to younger patients. Apparently, 20% of the octogenarians have a a bicuspid aortic stenosis and sometimes it's a matter of semantics because what, sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate between functional bicuspid and congenital bicuspid disease but still one in five of the octogenarians and so far bicuspid has been excluded from the randomized trials but there are some clear trends in TAVI or TAVR and that is that we are tackling younger patients uh, at lower risk with a lower uh, with a longer life expectancy and still there is this issue or not in terms of durability with these transcatheter aortic valves. So we need prospective research in TAVI, uh, and that is on the way. Again, uh, bicuspid aortic valves can be um, separated in terms of the RAFI, the presence of the RAFI, and the majority of the cases uh, relates to patients with a type 1 RAFI, and a lot of those uh, uh, type 1 RAFIs end up being functional bicuspids, so they are truly tricuspids. And this is the CT classification that also was shown by Dr. Galapas. And um, basically, a lot of the patients, they will have uh, tri uh, three commissures. And so there is a RAFI that then will separate one for, uh, or will connect uh, two commissures to become a bicuspid. But a lot of those patients will have uh, three commissures. Even in the bicommissural, sometimes it can be very difficult. Is this now three commissures or only one or only two commissures? So a lot of those uh, cases are not so straightforward. So I think uh, a lot of those cases could be eligible for a TAVI. So what is bicuspid aortic stenosis in contemporary practice? I did this prospective registry together with my friend DJ Chechi a couple of years ago, where we looked into all patients who were admitted for an aortic valve replacement to our practices. And this was a prospective study from, 2000, from November 2017 to February 2018, so only four months. We gathered 920 patients, 15% of those patients were identified as having a bicuspid aortic stenosis. And the first, the first diagnosis of bicuspid was made by echo in 60% uh, of the cases and by CT scanning in 35%. And still there was a, a number of patients that only the bicuspid could be identified during the open surgery. Type 1 bicuspid was present in over 80% of the cases and as expected, the majority of patients were younger. The mean age was 66 versus 77 years of age of patients with tricuspid aortic stenosis. And most frequently, these patients had mixed aortic disease. So it was a combination of aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. The majority of those patients were still being treated with surgery as shown here. So what are the challenges with bicuspid aortic stenosis in terms of tackling these with uh, TAVR? Well, first of all, it's an oval and large annulus. They are severely calcified and, and there is an abnormal or an atypical calcium distribution. Sometimes it can be a challenge to cross uh, the orifice with a wire. And there is concomitant aortopathy in 50% of the cases. So there are some anomalies in the elastin. So there is connective tissue disorder that also may affect the procedure along the way. And how do we need to uh, define the virtual annulus by angio if we have a bicuspid aortic stenosis. So there are all kinds of uh, issues related to this. Well, with the first generation of devices, the results with both Sapien XT and Coral Valve, they were not as good with uh, bicuspid in red as compared to um, tricuspid valves in blue in terms of paravalvular leaks in principle, especially with the self-expanding devices. Uh, PVL was much higher in the bicuspids, but with 
the next generation devices with Sapien 3 and for instance Lotus but also with Evolute Pro, uh, the differences between uh, bicuspidy and tricuspid valves in terms of clinical outcome including paravalvular leaks is not significant anymore. So um, the new technology really improved outcome in patients with bicuspidy or stenosis and in this uh, study by Yoon which is a retrospective analysis, the outcome, the clinical outcome at least to one year, so relatively short term, was completely similar between bicuspid and tricuspid aortic stenosis after TAVI. And this is uh, a couple of devices that we are using in, our, in my practice in Erasmus with a Lotus valve, a Sapien, and then an Evolute Pro. And in principle, you might end up with quite good results in terms of gradients and no PVL, but this is a typical example that you can encounter. And this was one of our earlier experiences. This was uh, a Sapien XT, but I liked the, the image. Uh, and it clearly shows that we uh, created a dissection in the ascending aorta. And we modified our practice along the way. In the beginning, we treated a bicuspid aortic stenosis as we treated a tricuspid valve, and that was a mistake because sometimes it can be very difficult to navigate through the bicuspid aortic valve and enter into the LVOT. And in this particular case, we had been struggling to get our sapien valve across uh, the bicuspid valve, and we uh, ended up dissecting the ascending aorta. This patient eventually did well, and we ended up doing the case with a relatively good result in terms of the valve performance, but there was some kind of um, excitement related to the ascending aorta, but this healed up over time, and the follow-up CT was um, basically quite satisfactory. But still, following that particular case, and I must admit we have another case where we also had an ascending aorta a dissection, uh, we now do a pre-dilatation in all our bicuspid valves uh, as compared to tricuspid aortic stenosis where we don't do a balloon pre-dilatation anymore. So this is uh, the Bavar study or results from the Bavar study and also do, uh, Dr. Jalapas uh, referenced this multiple times. This is a study that uh, was recently published in Circulation Cardiovascular Intervention. It also included uh, 100 patients patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis and we compare them, we propensity match them with also trans, uh, tricuspid uh aortic stenosis patients. Again, the majority of the patients had a type 1 uh, RAFE, so Severs 1 uh, bicuspid aortic stenosis. And what was interesting is that there was no difference in mean prosthesis to annulus ratio for BAV, for bicuspid or tricuspid valves, and also the, the sizing ratio between the prosthesis and the intercommissural diameter for bicuspids and tricuspids was relatively similar. And of course, more oversizing was being done with the self-expanding uh, Evolute device relative to Sapien or Lotus. So in conclusion of the Bavar, basically, and so there are several hypotheses. Some people say, well, you have to be very careful with the, with the commissures because there is all the calcium in bicuspid aortic stenosis. And people were already advocating that you, it's really mandatory to do your sizing and base your sizing on the intercommissural distance, four millimeters above the annulus. And I must say that Didier and I were a little bit on opposite sides. So he was a proponent of that strategy. And I was more like, no, no, we have to approach these valves like we approach tricuspid aortic stenosis. Well, at the end of uh, the study, we came to the conclusion that elapticity and size at the annulus level was the same for tricuspid and bicuspids. Elapticity and size was the same for bicuspid and tri tricuspids at every level above the aortic uh, valve annulus. And this has also been shown by Dr. Galapas, and it shows that only in 14% of the cases at the intercommissural level there was a tapering, and so it was smaller than at, than at the annual level. So only in 14% of the cases, in my opinion, it makes sense to downsize relative to the sizing based on aortic annulus. And of course, with the tricuspid valves, we are, basing, we are, we are sizing based on the aortic annulus. So I think I take that into consideration. So of course, we look at how uh, the aorta looks like uh, at the commissural level but also at the annulus and even below the annulus because in one in three of the cases, 
the, uh, the anatomy will taper down into the left ventricular outflow tract. And so if you oversize too much at the level of the left ventricular outflow tract, you will end up with more pacemakers and conduction disorders. So there is, it's more than just, than just relying on the virtual annular plane of the aortic valve. You have to take into, into consideration the intercommissural uh, level and the LVOT level, but all in all, only in a minority of cases, you will need to downsize at uh, relative to the intercommissural level. And this is data that has been presented uh, six weeks ago by Raj Makar at the ACC meeting. It is. Um, it comes from the TVT registry and it looks into the results of Sapien 3 in bicuspid aortic stenosis and comparing them also with, uh, with the results with Sapien 3 in tricuspid aortic stenosis. And to my surprise, almost 2,000 or more, almost 3,000 patients were already being treated with a Sapien 3 for bicuspid aortic stenosis in the United States. So quite a significant number of patients. And if you compare those patients to the tricuspid aortic stenosis, as expected, patients with bicuspid e were young and had a lower STS score but and interestingly uh, they were also uh, they were less frail or as expected again they were less frail than the patients with tricuspid aortic stenosis if you then do a propensity score matching what they did so they identified 2691 pairs of patients so over 5000 patients compared uh, with bicuspid and tricuspid aortic stenosis then they were well matched with a mean age of around 73 years old then it was clear that patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis ended up with the largest uh, sapien 3 valve and one in three versus one in four a quarter of the patients with tricuspid aortic stenosis so you probably will end up with larger sized valves because the anatomy the dimensions in the bicuspid uh, valve are larger and then the need for rescue surgery, annulus rupture, stroke, and pacemaker was slightly higher with bicuspid aortic stenosis, but still at the low end, less than 1% of rescue surgery, annulus rupture, and pacemaker rate somewhat higher, but still in the single digits. So these results, at least from a procedural perspective, are quite uh, satisfactory. And at one year, again, uh, the results were completely similar between uh, bicuspid and tricuspid uh, aortic stenosis treated with the Sapien 3. Also interesting in terms of PVL, there was no difference in severity of PVL after the valve and the gradients uh, after the procedure were also similar between bicuspid and tricuspid. At this point in time, there is a, a prospective registry ongoing in Europe uh, where it's called the Bivolute X. We are looking at several sizing uh, patterns, sizing paradigms, and we are comparing them. So some of the centers are sizing based on the intercommissural level. Other centers, like my center, are just focusing on the annular level, and only if there is significant tapering at the intercommissural level, we would address or adjust just our sizing algorithm and then we are comparing whether that would affect our outcomes and we have uh, a CT, EKG, an echo evaluation during follow-up and there is a core lab CT and echo analysis being organized. So TAVI for bicuspid aortic stenosis, it's all a matter of planning. And I think uh, if we move to younger patients, and we discussed already uh, the low-risk trials where the mean age was 74 years old, so does that mean that we also need to treat the 60-year-old? That's maybe a different uh, story, but still I would consider it based on considerate planning and also the interaction in our multidisciplinary heart team. And there are some facts and some aspects that might fuel or might drive the patient more to surgery. And there others that drive the patient more to TAVI. So if the patient is below 60 years old, and especially when you're considering a mechanical prosthesis, then I think uh, the patient should go for surgery. If there is concomitant aortopathy, which is often the case in bicuspid valve, valves, especially if the aortas are dilated or there is a coarctation, then of course surgery is the way to go. If there is excessive root calcification based on CT scanning, that's also a patient that I would send for surgery. Even if the patient is 80 years old and he is low risk, then I think if there is excessive calcium and we anticipate based on the CT scanning that there is a, a relatively high risk for mild or more PVL, we would send the patient for surgery. Low coronary ostia, because why would you risk coronary obstruction? A highly complex coronary artery disease, if uh, cabbage is better than PCI, then also we would send the patients for surgery. And when there is concomitant valvular 
valvulopathy that needs to be addressed by surgery, then of course combined uh, aortic and other valve surgery would be recommended. On the other hand, if we move to an uh, um, older age population, then again we would more uh, more consider uh, TAVI the same way if there is uh, presence of any comorbidity we would also consider TAVI and if the transfemoral approach is possible then also the likelihood of us selecting TAVI as the treatment of first choice is getting higher. So in conclusion I think TAVI is feasible in severe bicuspid aortic stenosis. The latest generation valves have the required features for success. 3D imaging planning is essential and do we need to refine our pre-procedural imaging or planning? That is the question and this is where hopefully Bivalid X will come up to fill in the gaps and I agree that we do need randomized trials at the end of the day comparing TAVR with SAVR in patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis to come up with a final conclusion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. You have answered a lot of my questions. Is there any other question to be asked? Okay, now. Uh, I would like to ask you about the incidence of uh, paravalvular leakage in uh, these patients, special patients. Yeah. Is the yeah, same so as the, in TAVI, in uh, tricuspid uh, valve? Yeah, so I think the, with the next generation or the latest generation devices that have that introduced the sealing fabric, I think the difference in significant paravalvular leaks between bicuspid and tricuspid after TAVI is uh, no longer significant. And this follows the data from the TVT registry and over uh, and almost 3,000 patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis, there was no difference in the presence of mild, moderate, or more PVL between the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves. And this is, uh, the situation is completely different with five or six years ago with the Sapien XT and the core valve. And I think this is where probably also, if you compare Evolute R with Evolute Pro, where the difference will be. I think in tricuspid aortic stenosis, at least in my practice, there is no difference in outcome between Evolute R and Evolute Pro with the bicuspids probably Evolute Pro will be uh, more performant than the Evolute R. So again, I think a paravalvular leak in properly selected patients should not be an issue for patients with bicuspid aortic okay. stenosis. Uh, and another balloon sizing technique uh, is a very helpful uh, tool in a uh, tabbing valve. Is always uh, necessary or not? I think balloon sizing is misleading, honestly. So I, uh, in the majority of my cases, I will rely on, uh, on CT scanning. Sometimes when I have a high-risk patient with a lot of calcium that the surgeon really turned down the patient, then I would like to downsize somewhat because of the excessive amount of calcium. And then sometimes balloon sizing uh, comes into play. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can we have the microphone, please? Thank you very much for the great talk. I mean, both your talks with Dr. Jalapa so really uh, went well together. You both alluded to the fact of um, LVOT and calcium and sizing and sealing, and I think we can really use that LVOT to our benefit, because especially if it tapers down, we can go with a smaller valve and maybe upsize with the balloon and get a good sealing effect without disrupting uh, uh, the annulus. And we've used that a lot of times with great success, uh, just really looking at LVOT a few millimeters below. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think uh, the LVOT, we need to take into consideration the dimensions of the LVOT, not only for paravalvular leaks, but also for conduction disorders, as I mentioned. Uh, the downside, however, is if you will end up with a smaller, selecting a smaller prosthesis, you will have more prosthesis patient mismatch. And this is where at this point in time in the randomized trials, at least with self-expanding valves and with also balloon expandable valves, at least in the intermediate and high-risk trials, there was the differentiator with surgery, that the uh, valve performance was superior with the transcatheter valve. And I'm not sure whether we want to give that up. Um, I think uh, the more challenging the anatomy gets and the more calcium there is, I would be more and more inclined to uh, try out the completely repositionable retrievable device, so the a a mechanical expanded lotus device, because then you can completely implant the valve, valve and then assess whether you're happy or not. If you're not happy, you can then reposition and then you can fine-tune your uh, final uh, valve positioning. <laughs> 